Thomas Piketty, welcome to the Daily Social Distancing Show. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, or should I say, comment ça va? Comment ça va? Très bien, merci. <laughs> um, you are one of the economists in the world who many people regard as a rock star economist, not just because of your ideas, but because of how easily you break your ideas down. One of the biggest things you talk about is inequality in the world. Coronavirus is going to shake up the world in a big way. Either there's going to be more inequality or things are going to get fixed. Just looking at the world the way it is now, what do you think we're about to experience? Well, you know, I think this is one of these crises that we see in history that can really change uh, people's view about the world and how we should organize the economy. Because at this stage, what we see is actually a big uh, uh, increase in inequality. So, you know, if you have a lockdown in a big apartment or in a big house, you know, it's not the same as if you are in a very small apartment or if you are homeless. And more generally, you know, if you have a very uh, uh, low wage and very precarious uh, job uh, job status you know you, you you have to go out to find work to find money you know even though this can be very risky for you uh, you have lots of problems with with people who still need to pay their rent i think this is a kind of time period where there is a pressure a strong pressure you know that can actually change the balance of, of power which is also a, a balance of ideology if we learned from the 2008 crisis if there's anything we learned, it was that the people who were the quickest to bounce back weren't people at all. It was the big corporations and the big banks. The little people lost everything. They lost their houses. They lost the money that they had put into their houses. They lost the jobs. Many people even lost their investment, whether it was 401ks or whatever they had put aside to save money in life. We learned about what happened, but if this is another recession, if this is another crisis, what can be done to prevent that from happening again? Well, first, I think we have to use uh, public debt and money creation uh, for the people rather than just for banks. So basically, after 2008, you know, we used uh, money creation in order to save Wall Street, to save bankers. You know, it's probably better than if we didn't do anything, because in the 1930s, we let financial institutions go bankrupt one after the other, and this was not very good. So at least we've learned from this experience. But, you know, it's not enough to save bankers. You also want to save the planet. You also want to save the people. And I think with this crisis right now, uh, uh, people uh, are going to be asking for proof that we can also use you know, this power of money creation and the Federal Reserve in order to invest in people, you know, investing in hospitals, investing in public infrastructure, uh, increasing, you know, wages for, uh, you know, healthcare workers and all the, you know, low wage and middle wage people, which we see today, you know, are so necessary for, for our existence and, and our, our societies. In the longer run, of course, uh, we cannot just pay for everything with public debt and money creation. So we'll have to rebalance uh, our tax system. I think we need a wealth tax in the US because an income tax you know is not enough to uh, to make the billionaire pay in proportion to their ability to pay you know very often you have billionaire like Warren Buffett uh, who actually said that he was paying a lower income tax rate than his secretary and this is because uh, many very high wealth billionaires uh, actually have a relatively small income because most of the uh, income to their wealth is being right. in a family holding or corporation. So taxing wealth in itself can make them contribute more in line with their ability to contribute. So the problem is not to punish wealth, it's just to make people contribute, you know, in proportion to their ability to contribute. Now, whenever, whenever people bring up that idea, whenever it's Bernie or Elizabeth Warren or anyone for that matter who says, we need a wealth tax. We need to look at different ways to tax the wealthiest of the wealthy, the billionaires and the corporations that have endless amounts of money and don't pay any taxes and find loopholes to not pay the taxes. The pushback inevitably becomes that you are discouraging innovation, you're discouraging the creation of wealth, and they say, oh, the money will move elsewhere. So if you were trying to convince a billionaire or if you were trying to convince a mega corporation to be contributing more and paying their fair share in tax, what would be in it for them? Why, why would you say to them, as Thomas, 
this is why you should pay more as a billionaire. This is why you should be paying more as a corporation. Well, you know, what, what I would say is that in the past three decades in America, you know, we've seen a lot more billionaires, but we've seen a lot less growth. And so in the end, you know, the idea that you get prosperity out of inequality just didn't work out. So, you know, of course, you need to pay them well when they are successful, but you don't need to, you know, you don't need to have people have 10 billion, 100 billion, you know, where, where are we going to stop? So the evidence that we have, again, is that the real source of economic prosperity is a, a moderate level of inequality, you know, reasonable mm -hmm. level of inequality, and education, education, uh, public health, and relative equality in access to education and health. This is what worked historically. This is the way we got our highest growth rate in history. And when we started uh, uh, sort of investing in billionaires rather than investing in, uh, you know, in education and health, in fact, we've had a growth slowdown. And the past three decades, you know, uh, have, have not been uh, decades of, of prosperity uh, for, for America. So at some point, you know, the, the theoretical discourse that we could have more growth by having more billionaires could be true, but if you look at evidence, you know, it's just, it's just not working. It's not happening. It's, yeah, it's, it's not, not happening. happening. So what do you think is the worst case scenario then? If, if you live in a world where the inequality just keeps on growing, the rich get richer and then the poor get poorer, what do we inevit inevitably get to? Well, to me, the worst scenario is that, you know, some skilled politicians, you know, like Donald Trump or, you know, Marine Le Pen in my country in France, you know, will uh, use the frustration coming from income and wage stagnation and rising inequality in order to point out, you know, some uh, foreign workers or, you know, some people to blame. And you can always find people to blame. You know, in, in the U.S., you can find Mexico, China. In France, you know, we could find uh, Germany or, uh, or North African uh, immigrants. You know, you, you always, it's easy to find people to blame. And, and this is what really uh, worries me, is that if we don't change the discourse, if, and if we don't propose another economic model that is more equitable, more sustainable, then in effect, you know, we open the door for, you know, all this nationalist discourse. And, you know, if you, if you keep telling people that there's only one economic policy and that governments cannot uh, reduce inequality, government cannot do anything about redistribution, taxation, and that the only thing that governments can do is to control borders, then you should not be surprised that, you know, 10 or 20 years later, the entire political discussion is going to be about border control and controlling national identities. Right. So I think there can be conflicting effects of this pandemic. On the one hand, this is going to reinforce the legitimacy of hospitals and public services and, and in a way, more equality. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, it could also reinforce, uh, you know, the fear of strangers and the, uh, the return to the borders of the, of the nation state. And which view is going to win, you know, depends also on all of us. This is a way, in the end, to pick the right trajectory, or at least to put pressure on, you know, our politicians and our political system to, to, to go in the, in, the, in the right direction. Thomas? Thank you so much for taking the time. Um, good luck in the pandemic, and uh, hopefully we'll see you on the other side. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye. Au revoir.